Uh, good afternoon. Um, my name is Brian Creamer. I'm a research analyst with Roth Capital Partners. It's an investment bank up the up the road in Newport Beach. Um, we focus on helping uh, micro cap and small cap publicly traded companies uh, raise money uh, from the capital markets. Uh, my focus is on clean tech. That's all I've done for about the last four years of my career. And right now, I'm actually on the other half of Roth Capital, not the capital raising part, but we also have a, a group of about 20 of us research analysts that write about publicly traded companies. Um, and this research is provided to institutional investors, hedge funds, pension funds, mutual funds. And again, uh, I, I focus on the clean tech sector. So right now, I follow about 10 publicly traded companies. And uh, my focus, particular focus, is demand side management, which fits right in with today's discussion. Um, so I think it's, uh, it's interesting that the panel now, I think we're going to segue from what EcoDog is doing, looking at discrete endpoints within the grid to a group of companies and, and one professor that spend their time looking at uh, the, the overall grid management itself. Um, and, and I thought I'd just toss a f quick few numbers out there coming from an investment bank that I think everyone might find interesting in terms of investment in the sector, both clean tech and then uh, more specifically, say, energy efficiency, demand side management. Uh, last year, 2009, uh, clean tech was the largest sector of VC funding. It's the first time ever it was the largest beating out biotech, software, you name it. About a quarter of VC money went into clean tech. Uh, the first quarter of this year as well, uh, clean tech did very well. This was the largest first quarter of, of any year um, going back since they were starting to follow the clean tech industry. And what was also very notable uh, this year, and I think the end of last year, is that we've seen a real shift in the investments within clean tech from both venture capitalists and private equity groups away from, not that it's still not happening, but there's a shift into smaller investments as well as into energy efficiency. And in the first quarter, energy efficiency resource management was the largest winner of VC money in Q1. And I think we'll see that continue as money starts moving towards smaller projects software-based and not, not a large capital investments. So with that, I'll um, tee it up for, I guess, um, Terry, you're going to start off. Is that right, I think? Um, Terry, and I was, is it Moan? Moan, yeah. Moan um, is with uh, Balance Energy, located in San Diego. Uh, Balance works with consumers, commercial industrial customers, in planning, implementation, and management of distributed generation and energy storage. Terry? Great. Well, thank you for the invitation to, to come here. Uh, setting up the stage for um, um, a real short talk about uh, kind of what's happening in the industry, I'll give a quick background of uh, myself. Uh, I started uh, working with in the energy sector uh, about eight years ago with San Diego Gas Electric and SoCal Gas. Uh, I was the technology strategist, and in 2005, I realized that there's a real opportunity for the utility to start being a forward thinker. Uh, in automating a lot of the grid. Uh, my background being uh, an IT guy, I, I really understood how technology can be an enabler. Uh, but I recognized that the utility, um, even though San Diego, I th think as Lisa mentioned early, uh, the utility is a leader today. Um, when we were starting in 2005 in the kind of the automation smart grid arena, we were like one of the only utilities. And the biggest concern we had was we don't want to buy version one of any product, and we don't want to be the only buyer of that product. So uh, I helped found an organization in Washington uh, called the Gridwise Alliance, which was focused on educating policymakers, starting in Washington, working our way to the state level, to encourage the uh, allowance of uh, business cases by the utilities to make investments in technology where it showed that that could be a very high societal benefit offsetting um, what traditionally had been the only way to, to make money in the utility was looking at the business benefit. The business benefit being what does a consumer get and how do the rates uh, react accordingly. So there was a, a big policy, policy push back in 2005 led to some great legislation uh, around um, why the utility sector needs to get involved in modernizing. 
And we kind of captured the term back then. Uh, it was more or less the smart grid, but we didn't actually coin it as that. It was mostly uh, modernizing the grid. But it took a couple years to get there. Um, we, the uh, Independent Security Act of 07 was kind of a landmark case which said public utility commissions across the United States need to start asking their utilities um, what their plans are for modernizing. It didn't um, require that there would be a, a, a mandated investment, but it just said what the states, it asked the states what they plan to do. Secondarily, it said the Department of Energy and the Department of Commerce need to come forward with some uh, strong plans that help encourage those utilities to make some investments. It wasn't until 2009 where we had the stimulus package that we actually had investment uh, grants that would co-fund projects across the United States. And we saw one of the slides earlier where $8.1 million or billion dollars was allocated in the smart grid space. Uh, that's just the tip of the iceberg uh, for what we need to do. Our industry, the utility segment, needs to make uh, close to $90 billion a year in investments in upgrading our infrastructure because it's just such a capital intensive uh, industry. And what we're starting to see now is um, because of those early investments uh, in late 2009, early 2010, we're starting to see an aptitude by uh, in other market players to start to compete in the market. And this is why I think the clean tech spec space is starting to pick up. It's really good to see that there's be a growth industry in a, in a kind of a new marketplace. And I think that it all results from the fact that there's an aptitude by very large capital invest, uh, intensive companies starting to make procurements. Um, so we're seeing that uh, evolution occur, but a, but a number of things uh, are also occurring. Uh, Larry did a really good job describing uh, kind of the, the fact that people need to pay attention and start to participate in a, in a growing concern, but the Kyoto uh, Accord did not um, produce effect. The uh, Copenhagen um, work did not really produce tangible effects. We're finding that a large, large number of these uh, organizations internationally are not really driving change within the utility sector. But what we're seeing, though, is that the states themselves, particularly in North America, are starting to uh, create uh, an environment in which that they're starting to mandate change because they're tired of waiting for the federal government or perhaps international organizations to push them. And so in California, we see a 20% uh, renewable requirement by the end of this year. Um, by the end of 2020, it's going to be 33%. Other states have even more uh, onerous uh, requirements for a renewable portfolio. Uh, take a look at Maine, it's 40% by 2017. So we're seeing now that the states are starting to drive a requirement to make investments in clean um, energy production. So there's a couple challenges uh, involved in that. Number one is we see that there's a huge interest in large-scale wind and large-scale solar deployments across the United States. The president has announced uh, willingness to consider uh, large-scale wind projects off the Atlantic shoreline. The biggest challenge here is not so much building the farms and finding the location to build the farms. It's actually transporting the energy. We're finding that is very, very difficult to install um, transmission lines between where the production facilities are and where the load pockets are. If any of you have watched what's happened in San Diego with the Sunrise Power Link, uh, if you go back in time, this particular transmission corridor has been in the planning process and in the litigation process for nine years. I think this is symptomatic of what's going to occur throughout North America, that we're not going to be able to produce uh, or, or build transmission lines fast enough in spite of the fact that the generation capacity is there. So we're going to start seeing a gravitation by the utilities and, and small consumers like universities and business parks, a gravitation of generation capacity on site. I think that the utilities will start to participate in that event as well because of the fact that transmission is hard to site. So new rules need to go in place. We need new incentives um, by the public utility commissions to authorize distributed generation and storage coupled with that so that we have efficient uh, production and consumption of energy. And we're going to start seeing this whole clean tech space really accelerate pr primarily on the distribution side, not so much on the large scale production side. 
Um, so that's kind of setting the stage. Uh, I'll be more than happy to talk about more details about some of those uh, other elements later. But that kind of sets the stage for where are we going as an industry and what's happening here. And the really cool thing is that San Diego is at the hub of a lot of this work that we're doing. Thanks. Um, next up, we have uh, Jan Kleisel, who's an assistant professor here at UCSD in the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering. Um, and he's done some interesting work on uh, microgrids, looking at interaction between thermal and electrical energy storage, um, as well as uh, the smart grid. Jan? I actually do have some presentation on the computer. Oh, OK. Yes, thank you. Yes, I want to talk a little bit about uh, what happens uh, once we do have a large amount of solar on the grid. How can we do the forecasting and integration of that solar power to uh, make it less onerous to utilities and uh, the independent system operator to operate a grid in that uh, future stage? So the general problem is with uh, renewables, they are not as reliable as uh, other power plants. While you could forecast a coal or nuclear power plant to a fairly high accuracy, uh, with renewables, you have uh, more trouble with that. You see here that increases even if you go uh, to shorter and shorter time scales. So if you want to manage everything on a 60-minute time scale, you see here the black line uh, is a fairly smooth curve, which you could predict quite well. But if you go to a one-minute power output from a a solar farm, then you are getting more and more fluctuations that are much harder to predict. And so this is uh, for solar energy, which is my expertise, is primarily due to clouds. Clouds cause about 40 to 70 percent um, reduction in power output of a solar farm. And so if you have those, it's almost like a, a binary system uh, for those who are computer scientists. It's uh, on or off, uh, full power or half power. This is how, how clouds operate um, on, on solar power plants. So uh, we can do forecasting. Utilities have, have done forecasting very well for a long time. They've always forecasted the load, which depends on the temperature, time of day, um, time of the week. And so they do that very well to about a 2% error margin. They can forecast how much load will be produced on any given day. Now we want to do as good with solar. And that turns out to be much more difficult. We have uh, weather models that do forecasting. We have satellites that can see clouds. But it turns out usually we have about uh, 20 to 40 percent error in this forecast, and that's on an hourly average basis. So if you went to a five-minute, one-minute basis, it would be even larger, up to 70, 80, 90 percent. Part of the reason is that we have so little data. Weather models are very good in forecasting wind and temperature because we have uh, so much data around. We have about five million data points that are input into our weather models every day from satellites, from uh, uh, buoys out in the ocean, from weather stations all around the country. Now, for solar, how many um, solar power measurements do we have in California? Any guesses? Turns out we have one. <laughs> so this is an NREL map. Uh, it, does, it first looked not so bad. These are all the stations that have been used to generate solar data. But it turns out only the circles are actually measured data. The rest are just uh, airports where they measure cloud heights and cloud types, but not actual irradiance, which is the, what you need for a, for a solar power plant. So we have uh, some, uh, some shortages there in really having the right data to do better forecasting. Now, my idea is to really go out and use existing data rather than building new measurement networks across the country, which are very expensive. And if we look at this map, we can see why. On this map, you see from the California Center for Sustainable Energy a map of all the PV systems in San Diego. And then the red triangles are the metered PV systems. And those usually have um, communication set up, have sensors set up, and could be used in real time to detect uh, the power flow from these systems. And guess what? Uh, output from a PV system is linearly proportional to the radiation received. So you can actually get a very good measurement of radiation if you just have that PV metered system data. And so we can use our own campus as a, a test bed. Um, Larry Smart talked about how densely metered our buildings are here. We also have um, about 10 solar PV facilities on campus. Those are the blue symbols. Here's I-5. We're about here right now. And then I myself set up a monitoring network of 
sensors for solar radiation measurement at the, the green sites. So we have a very dense network of uh, both uh, measuring solar research data, but also being able to test models that we would use in the future to integrate all these data and aggregate it into a, um, a forecasting product. So let me uh, skip over this. So in forecasting, we are focusing really in our work on the, the short time scale, which is uh, sky imagery. Uh, the longer time scales are weather models, our satellite maps, but usually they only update every half hour, and they have pretty coarse pixel sizes, so they cannot really resolve individual clouds that could affect a solar power plant. So we're looking at sky images that can go from 30 seconds to one hour ahead in the forecasting. Here's an example. That's a sky imager we have at our RIMAC facility. It has a camera looking down on a hemispherical mirror. It's basically a fisheye lens, uh, but inverted. And it's uh, being able to take a picture of the sky. And now, with our own eyes, we can easily determine where are the clouds in these images. And that's what we want to know for the, the solar forecast. So we develop computer models that can pick out where are clouds in these images and where are the clear skies. And then we go ahead and process these images to develop these uh, cloud maps that can map out all the clouds on the, uh, in the atmosphere. That's one element, but we also want to know where are those clouds moving so that if uh, La Jolla is still sunny uh, at 10 a.m. but it's becoming cloudy, what will happen over east of the I-5 in the next half hour? And so we can also use subsequent images of the sky imager to make uh, vector, vector maps of clouds so we can figure out how fast are these clouds moving and where will they be in a few minutes or half an hour from now. And so you can see that from this animation that indeed we're picking out the correct vectors, in this case the clouds moving uh, down from the top to the bottom, and we can predict the shading of these clouds. So I think we need some new tools specifically for a situation with high solar penetration on the grid because the solar forecasting right now is, is in a bad shape. But if we can aggregate uh, sky imagery satellites, especially with ground observations that can help us to calibrate these uh, forecasts, we can do a much better job in the future. We're going to demonstrate this at UCSD. Uh, and also we need to work on how can we aggregate all these other data from metered PV systems that's currently not online available but uh, could be uh, another value proposition to owners of PV systems to share that data with a forecast provider. Thank you very much. I want to interject here just to provide a little context uh, to the discussion. Um, and that is um, what Jan's doing is extremely important. And the reason is that the state of California has mandated that these public utilities generate 33% of their power from renewable sources by the year 2020. Now, this, the, the, the situation is essentially that um, utilities have operated as a centralized power generation system where the utility is in control of the power plant. And as demand rises in the summer when the temperatures get warm, the utility is able to increase the power plant production to match the demand. And as we go to a system where we have a third of the power being generated by solar, and the solar is fluctuating, it's much more difficult for the utility to match that production to the demand. And that's why uh, it becomes so important to uh, have these sensors that can help the utility operators determine, <clears throat> well, how much solar production are we going to have at any given instant? The other thing that's kind of obvious here is if you have a cloud pass over and um, you lose 50 megawatts of power or something like that, where are you going to make it up from? And that's why energy storage has become so important. And the reason why uh, Terry is here is this idea of having microgrids on the system is a great way of uh, having the capability of increasing their capacity in a particular business park or um, um, army base or a university campus. If they have that capability, they have extra power, they could actually increase their power to match um, what's needed on the grid. So uh, I just wanted to sort of explain that. 
Um, our next speaker is Alex, and Alex is representing Zementus, which is a uh, startup software company that uh, is doing uh, analytics, software analytics and prediction. Um, and the reason Alex is with us today is because the CEO, Michael Zeller. Uh, can you give us some news, uh, Alex? I warned you I was going to put you on the spot. Yeah, no, that's fine. Uh, thanks, Bruce. Uh, no, yeah, I'm subbing from Michael. Uh, he just had his first child last night, so uh, although he would... Yeah, so he just had his first child last night, and uh, obviously he's very busy today. I got a text message from him saying, good luck, uh, the baby's okay, and you know, so. See you tomorrow. <laughs> see you tomorrow. Well, I don't know tomorrow, but uh, um, you know, we're very happy for him, obviously. I had little time to prepare, but I hope I can give an overview. Uh, so thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, Zementis is uh, a company that specializes in predictive analytics, and I want to ask you a question to, so that I can judge how many of you use predictive analytics on a daily basis. Just one? Okay, let me rephrase the question. How many of you use predictive analytics on a daily basis? True. How many of you own a, uh, have a credit card in your pocket? Most of you, obviously. Every time you use that credit card, predictive analytics or neural networks actually scans that transaction and looks for uh, the probability of that transaction being fraud. So if you get a call from your bank saying, is this really a transaction? That's really a neural network that's making that decision uh, for the bank to call you. Every time you go to Netflix and you search for movies and you see all those amazing recommendations, like, oh my God, they know so much about my taste. That's a recommender system that's based on predictive analytics. Every time you go to the supermarket and you get coupons, that's market basket analysis, that's predictive analytics. Even the display of the items in the shelves works with predictive analytics. Uh, people that bought this are more likely to buy this as well. So as you can tell, predictive analytics really permeates uh, our lives today, and I think, uh, my belief is actually that that will be more of a commonplace even uh, as we move forward, of course. And the main reason for that is because we're collecting um, large, large amounts of data, as we, we all know. Um, Larry actually mentioned learning theory, and that's the idea of, you know, you look for these patterns in your data, and then you predict things that will happen, right? Um, so let me look at my cheat sheet here. Since I didn't have much time to prepare, I have an excuse. Um, so Zemens has offices here in uh, San Diego and Hong Kong. Uh, we are the makers of Hadapa. Hadapa is a platform for uh, deployment of these predictive analytic systems. Um, Adapo works with uh, rules, which is the logic you need to create decisions on top of your predictions, as well as predictive analytics. Um, all this can be done in real time, of course, and I think that's a really a key point for the future of the smart grid is actually predictions that happen in real time. You have large, large amount of data that you have to process. How can you do this in real time? And so I think now the technology is available for us to process that in real time. Um, another thing that uh, we kind of claim as our claim to fame is uh, we launched uh, around two years ago Adapa, this platform for deployment of predictive uh, solutions on the Amazon cloud. So uh, today anyone anywhere in the globe can actually use our system through the Amazon uh, computing cloud. And uh, we have clients from all over the world, it's amazing, that use this system 24-7. So it's really a revolution in that sense. And the best part, of course, it's offered as a service so that you, be, you pay actually for the actual usage of that software, which in our case is 99 cents per hour. So it makes really you know, affordable for people in emerging countries, especially to use predictive analytics on a daily basis. Second uh, cheat sheet here. I'm not like Sarah Palin, I'm not reading my hand, so I think I'm better than that. Uh, sorry for that. Um, so, why am I here? Um, well, two, around two years ago, I think, we started collaborating with uh, SAIC in uh, creating predictive analytics systems for the smart grid. And, uh, you know, this can be applied in so many different ways. Uh, but, you know, one thing that we focused in the beginning was uh, predictive maintenance. Now, you can see there is all this data from, coming from all these grid components, uh, transformers, sensors, uh, smart meters, 
I mean, how can you know use predictive analytics to predict when you know one of these uh, components is going to fail? And as a matter of fact, you can do that. Um, so that's one thing. I want to actually make also, make also a distinction between uh, we, we hear a lot on the news about analytics. IBM has this global initiative about analytics. Now, analytics can actually be divided, data analytics can be divided in two kinds, predictive analytics, which is the one that I've been talking to you about, and also uh, the other kind of analytics that's more like a reporting kind of thing. And uh, that's really called descriptive analytics. And I think uh, EchoDog actually was a great example of that. You know, we have all these reports and alerts saying, hey, uh, do an action now, right? So that's one level of analytics that you, you, you look at what happened and you measure things, how many, how often. Now, predictive analytics actually tells you what's happening next. So, uh, you know, I see applications in energy theft detection. You know, you actually try to stop the energy theft uh, as it happens or uh, do predictive maintenance, send a crew out to replace a transformer before it actually breaks and things like that. And also on the smart metering part, uh, how to actually create intelligent dashboards for uh, the consumers on the, uh, as related to the uh, EchoDog uh, product, Fido. So that's really where we stand today. Uh, thanks so much. Any questions in the audience? In the back? Do we have a microphone or? Maybe while they're going back, I'll, I'll start it off with um, with Zementis maybe. The question, I think you made a good point. I mean, the focus there is really on the grid infrastructure. And I think uh, it might be interesting to hear from both you and Terry because there's some, uh, you know, when people hear about the smart grid, most people always think smart meters. That's what we see all the time. But certainly folks I speak with in the industry view the grid, and Terry, you mentioned it, the, the, the massive amount of capital that's necessary just to maintain it on a yearly basis, but to make that part of the grid, the whole grid itself, smarter and things like that. So if you might comment on, on that piece of it. Yeah, from my point of view, I mean, just gathering the data is not enough, right? Um, what I've seen, actually, I had the opportunity to visit, to visit utility companies and come through the databases, and uh, there is really massive amount, massive amount of data being gathered today from all these grid components. But, uh, you know, as you start digging deeper, how much of this data is actually usable, right? How, uh, what is the quality of that data? So really, I mean, I think people have to be aware that in order to get it to the level of smartness that we want, right? We have to start uh, getting quality data and start to invest more into, you know, uh, descriptive and predictive analytics to make use of that data in, a, in ways, in creative ways that we actually can, you know, reach the targets that, uh, uh, you know, we talked before. And my perspective is uh, coming back from my, my legacy with the utility. Um, I didn't mention this, but... I'm not with the utility anymore. I left them to start another company uh, to build microgrids. But what we found is that uh, the utility model is broken. Uh, it's broken because uh, you don't really know what the cost of your energy is other than by looking at your bill. You look at your bill, oh, well, that's, that's the value because I'm going to pay the bill. But we don't have a retail market uh, for buying and selling energy. Uh, it's just the nature of the beast. Uh, we have central power plants. They distribute power down to the masses, and the masses uh, consume it gladly and pay their bill gladly sometimes. The thing is, uh, the amount of information available to the utility to manage that is so scarce that uh, it's appalling that it even works, but it does. So as consumers start to build their own solar rooftops, and there's huge incentives to do that. I mean, you can put the cost of your solar plant in your tax bill. I mean, this is very inexpensive for you to put a solar plant on your house. As we start to see an evolution where distributed generation, and that being generation of power by the consumers, starts to become more prevalent, the archaic system that we have today in, our, in the way in which we manage uh, power delivery is not going to work. The reason being is that we have a, a delivery system that is designed for power flow in one direction. It's called a radial power delivery system. You have a hub, a bunch of spokes, and all the spokes are your houses, and power goes in one direction. 
As soon as we start to start, start generating our own power, and putting it back onto the grid, the grid is going to collapse because it's not designed to deal with that. So we need analytics to start to figure out how do we start to move the flow of power, accommodating um, neighborhoods, maybe um, some neighborhoods are more inclined to have solar rooftops. Uh, maybe some aren't. But nevertheless, we're going to see a, an emergence of uh, power generation on the consumer side, the ability to manage their own power footprint using EcoDog's product, um, and as much as uh, supplying excess capacity back onto the grid. At that point in time, we're going to see an interest by those consumers who are supplying power to say, hey, I don't think this bill is right anymore. I want real market rates. Then we're going to start to see a transition towards this ecosystem that uh, I think is going to be prevalent, and that is the design of microgrids. I think microgrids today are uh, still an experiment um, by the maybe two dozen organizations that are, are implementing them, but I believe that uh, we can turn that into a commercial entity. However, uh, there still has to be a huge collection of information. It is possible that a campus can participate in real time, a campus like this university could participate in real time with an oversupply of wind coming from Tapache uh, up in the, the Bay Area. If there's an oversupply of generation and those generators are willing to sell energy at a negative cost, then the university would want to stop producing their own power and just consume. And if they knew in real time that that information was available, that they could uh, start consuming that power based on the availability, then we would start to see the, the transformation of our, our industry. And the adoption of this analytics uh, is even better because when the wind turbines start to spin, right now we have no way to know that they're spinning real fast or they're not other than they're just producing power. Mm -hmm. If we could predict that they're about to spin faster, then we could start to take some proactive measure on the distribution side for all the campuses across the state or wherever they're in, in location uh, in proximity to those large power systems. So I'll stop there. Hi, um, my name is Gina Duranti. I'm with Green Path Consulting. And I guess my question is mainly for Terry. And you may have just answered part of it, but um, Prop 16 on the ballot today kind of reminds us that oh, there's. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Not getting political, but it reminds us there's still resistance, right? I mean, on the one hand, you know, you've just told us that, that I mean, microgrids are happening, right? It's, it's an inevitability in a way, and yet you've got the technical problems of the way the utilities are, you know, have historically produced and distributed power. It makes it very difficult to have distributed ger generation on a large scale basis. And so I guess I'm wondering, like, What's the biggest, you mentioned analytics, maybe analytics is the answer to helping make that transition to a more distributed generation grid, but what do you think is maybe the biggest thing that's going to unlock the key, and how long do you think it's going to take in years? Well, first of all, um, prop, just in case anybody hasn't heard about Prop 16, Prop 16 is a means in which the monopoly becomes even more of a monopoly. Uh, it it pr protects the utility from allowing um, municipalities to produce their own generation and prov provide that to their local constituents. But in terms of um, the evolution, uh, what I believe is going to happen within the next five years, uh, it is inevitable that because of what I was saying earlier, by uh, the regulatory push for including renewable generation into every utility across North America, whether it's by the states or by the federal government, because of the challenges of transporting that energy, you're going to see a gravitation of energy production closer and closer to the edge. The only way to manage that is through sophisticated systems. And you need analytics, you need control systems, you need sensors, uh, you need to um, educate consumers. Uh, all of these elements, all of, all of these facets do require um, high tech. and it's, it's, I think the, the market will evolve just by the very nature that there's a demand. Um, I don't think that we have to push anymore. I think that the legislative products are in place, um, both at the federal and state level. Uh, I would like to see a, a national renewable portfolio standard. Uh, I think that would kind of um, give the impetus for the coal-fired states to get on the bandwagon. I think that um, uh, cap-and-trade for carbon is an insurance policy, and I don't think it's going to work. 
I really think that uh, a mandated generation capacity by percentage is the right way to cause a reaction, a chain reaction, uh, down to every producer of generation. And we're going to see that just because of the challenges in the large-scale systems of transporting that, that power, that a lot of that is going to occur on the distribution side, college campuses, business parks, uh, your own solar rooftops. I think we're going to see a lot more of that in the next five years. Other questions? So, so just out of curiosity, you were explaining that consumers don't understand their bills and so forth, and that there is a lot of predictive data. But you have here in San Diego a utility company that is still has not the capacity to provide in the electric bills the power factor. And they are spending millions of dollars in putting these new smart meters, and still with the smart meters won't be able to provide you with the power factor. How are they going to predict anything if they don't know which entities have a lower point in, in power factor? San Diego Gas Electric is installing uh, 1.4 million electric meters, 800,000 gas meters that are all connected through radio systems. Each one of those meters is a sensor point. It is an absolute truth that sdg &E doesn't know what to do with all that information. Uh, but they are collecting it, and they are going to start uh, managing it and massaging it, and they're not the only utility. It, it is a absolute fundamental that the regulatory commissions will insist that those investments are enablers for um, consumer benefits. So at a minimum, the utilities are going to collect massive amounts of data, store them, store that data, and then provide those some sort of analytics in the future. And they don't, they don't really know what all those analytics are. But at a very minimum, one thing that we do today, in, unless you have the um, digital meter on your wall, on your, on your house, the only way for the utility to know that your power is out is by you giving them a phone call. At a minimum, your customer service quality is going to improve because the current meters, the digital meters that are going in, have a a last gasp, if you will, phone home, that the power just went out. That's a good thing. That means that the service window for your outage is much smaller than those that have to pick up the telephone because you, don't, you may not find about, out about it until you come home at night from work. So there are a lot of opportunities here. We've just scratched the surface. Yeah, I think, you know, in, in terms of predictive analytics, I, I agree with you. I think they're in the right. They're capturing a lot of data. They have no idea what they want to do with it. But it's, it's up to, I think, to, to us in the industry to actually go through this data and, 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 and find the patterns, but define the problems first, right? What are we trying to solve? How can we benefit the, consum the consumer with this data now? How can we justify all this money that we're spending in putting all this, uh, you know, smart meters, you know, in everybody's homes. How can we give back, right, now that we put all these things? I had a question on, um, I've <clears throat> talked to a number of the Northern California, the biggest of the VCs that are investing in uh, alternative energy, and they say exactly the same thing as you do, that the, they, they call it, you want to stay away from, uh, silver or gray poles and you want to look at brown poles. So you want to look at being able to use the current electrical wires, bring your generation in locally and not do what you would have thought was logical in the 20th century when centralized generation of energy and put them out in the desert and then bring in the, uh, because of the political opposition to transmission lines. Nimbyism, yeah. Yeah, so, <clears throat> and yet every time I go out of LAX, I look down on probably square miles of flat rooftops that are perfect for this. Mm -hmm. uh, they're already got electricity coming into the building, so the wires that could take the electricity out are there, or at least it could defer what's needed locally. <clears throat> and I've been here for 10 years, and I haven't seen any solar going up on top of any of those. What is missing here? I mean, it seems like you've got so many things in place to make this local generation happen. I mean, on this campus, we just put in <clears throat> one going on two megawatts. 
<coughs> of solar on the parking structures. <clears throat> but um, it, why is it so slow? Well, um, okay, so w one is that you have territories. Each territory is a regulated environment. So up in uh, the SoCal Edison territory, except for uh, the LAX, that's LADWP. Well, LADWP, the, the Water and, and Electric District, um, doesn't have to comply with public utility rules in the way that the investor-owned utilities do. And so the investor-owned utilities have a very regimented, fast-paced approach to get to solar rooftops, where the, that um, solar rooftops in LADWP uh, territory is based on incentives. So there are incentives available, um, but it's by the consumers having an interest. However, uh, some of the interesting things that have happened, the utilities recognize what I've just said and what we're just arguing here is that there's going to be a high preponderance of distribu distributed generation. The utilities definitely want to get in the game, but how do they own and operate an asset on a customer's premise? Well, they're taking small steps to get there, and one of them in, in, here in um, San Diego Gas Electric is the utility would like to own the inverter while you own the solar panel. And the reason they want to do that is they want to manage the power flow back into the grid so that it's not disruptive. So you consume all the power you want, any excess, um, they will then flow it back into the grid. I think that's a great plan. They don't have to own everything, but they can own part of it. And then it manages the stability of the grid. Uh, we've seen that uh, PG&E, uh, they've had a couple projects where they own massive amounts of solar rooftop. They, they make the investment in it, and they uh, sell the power back to the consumer. That has also shown uh, an economic model for third-party providers. Third parties will come in, they'll build your solar rooftop, and they'll just charge you rent, essentially, and they will sell you your power. So we see new markets starting to evolve out of the opportunity that lies here in California. But uh, what you've pointed out that, uh, around LAX, uh, there are dead spots where some, uh, the localities and, and the, the way in which that particular franchise is set up are not mandated like other franchises are set up. I mean, I would also just add costs, right? I mean, just in the last year, we've seen the price of solar because so much production has been put online, predominantly in China, low cost solar panels, it's dropped by 40%. The cost to put solar on your roof or to put it in a field or on a rooftop, instead of being $6 a watt for the entire installed system, it's $4 or less. So where they were talking about doing concentrated solar out in the Arizona deserts, now they, you know, they're talking about just putting solar panels because they're becoming so cheap. And, you know, I think you're going to continue to see the price come down and you know, return on investment and all those things that the financial folks worry about get that much better. You know, so, so based on that comment, um, there's a recent study that was done by SDG&E uh, very interesting and very important one that we got to realize that even though we see the uh, the increased penetration of solar rooftops, um, it is very disruptive to the operation of the grid. Uh, an example is that um, a study w that was done just two weeks ago showed that a uh, one megawatt solar production site uh, on a factory was putting power back into the grid. It was a 12,000 volt power line that it was putting it in, so it was on the transmission side. They showed that um, with one cloud passing over that solar panel, the voltage fluctuated over 1,000 volts <laughs> in that short period of time. Now, if that were to continue without recognizing the condition, it could start blowing out transformers. So there are challenges, and you know, having software that predicts you know, the overflight of, of clouds is very important in those situations. I have a question. Um, Jan, you've made a very good case for um, establishing a sensor network in a locale that would help the utility operator predict solar radians so that they can anticipate these clouds that might pass over um, as an academic exercise, I guess. So my question is, what would be a commercial, how, how could what you've, what you've done be commercialized or do you see a path to creating a business around that? 
Yes, actually, there's a good example in the wind forecasting business because uh, wind power has been much uh, higher penetration on the grid uh, since a few years ago, and there are wind power forecasting companies, several of them in the United States, that uh, usually use uh, sensors at the uh, turbine hubs at the wind farms um, and feed it into their forecast models, which are partly weather forecast models, partly uh, predictive analytics uh, models. Uh, and so that model could be followed similarly with solar, with difficulty being that different tools are required because uh, the clouds are much more difficult beasts to lo localize exactly than uh, high and low wind areas are. So there are models out there to how to do that, but the, I think the unique thing, about, unique thing about the urban solar is that there are so many different parties involved that own these uh, sensors and own the systems so that the market of sharing information or selling data for forecasting purposes is something that has not been figured out yet how to do that properly. So I, th I wanted to interject one other little piece of information in this conversation, and that is I checked last week with SDG&E on this point because I couldn't remember. So the, the state mandate is that 20% of the power that's, that, that San Diego Gas and Electric has on their grid now is supposed to come from renewable sources. And I think it's about 18%, 16 or 18%. But sdg &E says that they, they qualify. It's sort of like, um, it reminded me of the, of the pirate code, you know? And <laughs> they're, more, they're not really rules. They're more in the way of guidelines. And, um, but the point that I checked was, that all of the rooftop solar that exists in San Diego on uh, homes and commercial buildings is currently not counted as part of the 20 percent. And, you know, I think that that's part of the sort of the resistance that somebody had a question about in terms of trying to integrate all of the sources of renewable energy into the system. Uh, but it does have a benefit uh, in, in that if the um, total production requirement from sdg and &E was X, but that X was lowered because of solar rooftops, then their current fleet of renewable in proportion would increase. So it is actually beneficial to have solar rooftops. Say that again. <laughs> if, so the, the, the base load production for sdg and &E is 4,500 megawatts. And so out of that, they need to produce 20%, you know, 900 megawatts of renewable generation. However, if that 4,500 was to reduce by 10%, say to 4,100 megawatts, then their current fleet of production would, would probably put them over that threshold requirement because it's, the requirement has actually been reduced by solar rooftops, consumers producing their own power. <laughs> uh, I wanted to know about, oh, there it is, um, unintended consequences. A year ago, I got one of those little uh, things you plug in and you find out how much power each appliance is using, and I realized my television was costing me about $6 a month in electricity. And my thought was, that's cheap. Uh, I don't have to. <laughs> and so I'm wondering if in, in the kind of work that you've done, either in predictive analytics or in trying to figure out getting this information to customers, do you risk getting people uh, to act in ways you don't want them to act? And, and what about that? That's a good question, and I, I would add that more to that. I mean, especially uh, imagine like by the end of the year, some of us probably will be getting a Nissan Leaf, right? Uh, like Larry mentioned. Now you're plugging a car into your, it's not a TV anymore, right? And that will cost you a lot of money. And I think that will bring awareness much more to where the power is coming from, how much am I actually paying for this, how much my TV is costing, because at the, the cumulative cost of all your car and all your appliances, then we'll make, we'll, you'll make a, a dent into your, your budget, right? And then you really have to be informed to make uh, the decisions you want. 
But now, uh, to the point that, can I use that information in a bad way, or is, will it be a misinformation? Is, is that a good aspect or not? I think that's to be told. Right? It's a story that still, I think, it's, it's going to happen. Because, I mean, uh, as you see, Ecodog just put this amazing product, and, you know, people are becoming more and more aware. But I think as we move towards an electrical, uh, you know, system in which we have cars and all kinds of things connected to the grid, then we are going to use that information more proactively. We're going to be actually more proactive in using that information. We're going to be demanding more information and using it in different ways as consumers. I don't know. Uh, well, I, I think there's just a general apathy in most consumers as to their uh, behavior to power costs. And it goes back to a statement I made earlier that we really don't understand the bill, so we just pay it. Uh, with the digital meters, you'll be able to look at your uh, scg &E website bill profile or go to some of the third party, use EcoDog's product, and you can look at your cost not only by the day but by the hour. Now, you have to decide, are you going to do something about that or not? Uh, we've done studies. Uh, I, I'm an advisor to the uh, California Energy Commission on the studies of um, human behavior around these new smart meters. And we found that, uh, on average, we will receive 15 minutes of attention per consumer for lifespan of that smart meter. So when we educate them, we want them to act right then, because we want them to set up their thermostat. <laughs> We want them to set up any of their technologies within the home and do it once and forget about it because that's just basically going to be their behavior. So we need to make this as easy to do as possible, but we need to get them involved you know, as, as soon as the technology is available for them to consume. Any other questions? I see one. Terry, you mentioned 4,500 megawatts of baseline production by SDG&E, and I would guess that the Chula Vista plant and the Carlsbad would maybe be 500 megawatts. Help me out on this. That would indicate a lot of the, quote, production is imported. Uh, could you help me understand uh, it, are, the, are those, would that be a, a good estimate on how much is imported? And that would support uh, the Sunrise Power Link uh, argument to def, uh, send, um, produce uh, renewables from outside of San Diego. I don't know exactly how many power plants are in San Diego, but the imports are actually relatively small. Uh, take San Onofre, sdg &E owns a little less than 20 percent, maybe close to 5 percent of San Onofre. Uh, there's the Encinas power plant uh, up Carlsbad. There's a Chula Vista power plant. So there are quite a number of power plants. And what we need to do is as those power plants start to retire, uh, we want to replace those, or sdg &E wants to re replace those with renewable power plants. Um, so I would say that the importing of power probably occurs mostly during the summer months, during our peak periods. And uh, that is fraught with peril in the sense that uh, we're also competing with SoCal Edison for the same power. There's only one transmission line coming from north to south. It turns out that San Diego is a cul-de-sac for power import. So we have to produce our base load, essentially. And so the peak either comes through uh, coming, flowing down this transmission line, or we have to turn on peaker plants. And peaker plants are incredibly expensive, and we want to try to use other technologies to offset the peaker production uh, and that being energy efficiency, demand response, and consumer-owned generation. Uh, the other part of that is, um, I think it was two or three months ago, maybe the um, state regulators allowed utilities to trade their renewable credits from out of state. So we're importing the renewable credits from wind farms in Montana and Wyoming, places like that. Any other questions? Um, you know what? It's uh, time for a networking break. Uh, when we get back, uh, we're going to um, we're going to hear from On Ramp Wireless, which is a San Diego company that is um, doing sensor networks in the power grid. So, thank you.